All right, you guys may be seated for a minute. So a couple things. The mission of Rock Church, if you don't know, if you're new here, um, if you aren't new here, you should know this, but it is this, to know God, to find family, to live kingdom-centered lives, and to be on mission together. Here's the thing. We're moving to two services next week. I've already said this, and I'm going to say it again. I want you to understand. It's going to feel different. It's going to feel smaller intentionally. The beautiful part about that is look, at, look around this room. There's a ton of people here. We're going to be able to more intimately connect with one another and also open up the sanctuary to more people to come in, yes? Remember, that last thing, be on mission together. One of the best ways to get out of your life circumstances and your funks and all, listen, anyone had a week? Anyone else? Look at us. I've had a week too, right? But one of the best ways to get out of that is to get out of yourself. Right? To stop focusing so much on ourselves and to think outside. How can I reach more people for the kingdom? Right? What can I do for others? That's the mindset I want us to have as a body as we come in to this season of two services. Yeah? Uh, second thing, marriage retreat. They just mentioned it, but I haven't talked about it a lot. Listen, marriage is a huge deal in this church. Why? Because it's a huge deal to God. I put up a post recently on Facebook. Listen, way too many of us are trying to make ourselves happy with circumstances. I need a better job, I need a better career, I need this, I need that. Listen, if us men especially would focus on two things, number one, our relationship with God, and number two, our relationship with our wives, can I tell you that our lives would be a whole lot better? And I'm asking the men in this room that are married to lead your wife and say, you know what, we're going to take a weekend and we're going to put our marriage first, right, because we know that God's going to bless it. We've done this for years, and I have seen year after year, here's what happens, and men, you're probably gonna hate this, but I don't care, because you need it. God will expose things that maybe you didn't realize were in your marriage that he wants to heal. He will expose chaos in your marriage that maybe you didn't see that was there. We get so easily going through routines that we don't realize that there may be brokenness in your marriage. God will honor it if you'll focus on it, yeah? All right, will you guys stand up with me real quick as I read the word? We're continuing our series in 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter, uh, we're finishing chapter 14. Last week, if you remember, we talked about speaking in tongues, because that's the passage that we were in. This week, Paul's talking about services, what it looks like. We're in 14, verses 26 through 40. Paul says this, what then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there only be two or at most three and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there's no one to interpret, let each one of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that you may all learn and be encouraged. And if the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they, learn, they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for today, for the word that you have for us. God, for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we are broken people in need of healing. We are broken people in need of grace. I'm so thankful that we get to come each week into this sanctuary as temples of the living God and receive from you. God, would we hear what you have to say? Would it shape us and mold us? Would you have your way in our lives? And all God's people said, you may be seated. So if you know me, not to talk about me too much, but you know me at all, when I get into something, I get into that thing. Like all the way in. Right now, for whatever reason, I'm into football. Anyone else into football in here? 
Listen, I was into it all growing up. It was my obsession. I wanted one thing in life. You can ask my parents. I was going to be in the NFL. That is all I cared about. Well, what if for whatever reason, after high school, I kind of got out of it. I didn't really watch sports anymore. But lately, I have been like all consumed with football. And I think part of it is my son started playing for the first time. And of course, I go to his first practice, and I'm sitting there, and I'm watching the coaches, and I'm like, no, that ain't right. No, 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 no. And before you know it, I'm almost taking over the team. I'm this close. So I've started coaching the team uh, three nights a week. And consequently, during this, I'm like, I'm getting into football. I start watching football shows on Netflix. Well, there's this show. Has anyone heard of the show Last Chance You? Man, there's this show. Basically, they take troubled youth, troubled kids that come. They're basically Division I athletes, but they have terrible grades. They come from terrible upbringings, and their last chance is to go to a junior college and try to make it to Division I. Well, what's amazing, if you understand football, the what I love about the sport of football is that really to have a good team, it's got to be well-ordered. There are so many moving parts to a football team. You've got 11 guys on both sides. If one person misses their assignment, you can screw the whole play. The game can completely be lost if one guy misses an assignment, misses a block, runs the wrong route. What's cool, though, is they take these troubled youth, and when you see success, right, it's the team that's well-ordered. Chaos breeds losses. Well, listen, Paul's main purpose in the message this week is exactly that. He re-emphasizes over and over that in a service, when we come together, that God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. Now, I want to go through this. So, he opens up saying, what then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only one or two, or at most three, and each in turn, let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each one of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the one weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting line, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Paul here is dealing with a church whose services clearly were chaos. We know that from last week. Basically, it sounds like to me, we don't have a perfect picture, but it sounds like to me that the whole church was just uproar speaking in tongues and going crazy. Paul comes in and says, no, 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 no. Listen, there needs to be order. But what's fascinating here is he desires that all of them prophesy. He's speaking to the church like, listen, you should all be involved in the worship of God. Now, in the Bible, this is the clearest picture that we have of what a church service looks like. I want you to think about that for a second. In all the denominations that we know, all the church services we've been to, right, Roman Catholicism, everything that we know and understand about a church service, this is the clearest picture of a church service in the New Testament, When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Does that sound like services that we've experienced in the church? Now, I love this picture of church for many reasons. If I'm honest, it reminds me a lot of our church. I'm not bragging, but this is exactly what we desire to have at Rock Church. Think about it. You show up to Rock Church, Tanya and her team are doing their thing. They're making coffee. They're serving cookies. By the way, I had a girl come in church this morning. She's this tall, and I got the wrath because we ran out of cookies and donuts. So whoever is in charge of that, we might need more. The eyes I got, man, I'm almost too condemned to get up here and preach this morning. But listen, Sam and his team has a hymn, right? Maybe Keith has a word of prophecy. Maybe Laura Lee has a word of prophecy. I have a lesson. It's the body coming together corporately to give out, not just to receive. But it's done in order. God does not want you and I on the sidelines in worship, but wants everyone involved in worship. A house full of people who are personally ordered will be a house full of contributors in worship. Hear what I just said. 
A house full of people that are personally ordered will be a house full of people that are contributors in worship. Now, I'm going to read some stats here that I want you to understand. I think that a lot of this is why we see the problems in the American church that we do. 41% of Christians in America believe the church is a trustworthy organization. 41%. So that means 60, or no, 59%. Is that, my, is that good math? Thank you. 59% don't trust the church. 20% of millennials believe church going is important at all. 20%. 40% of millennials consider themselves unaffiliated with any type of church. Gen Z, we, know, we now know, is twice as likely to be atheist. Now, uh, the obvious question is why? Why is that? Carrie Newhoff, church leadership expert, believes this. The church has followed the culture down a road of entertainment, not discipleship. Consumerism has not only infiltrated the church, but has become a religion in itself. Consumerism. Sky Jathani, in his book, How Churches Became Cruise Ships, says it this way. The logic was simple. If the baby boomers did not feel the need to connect with God, then perhaps another felt need would draw them into the church. The need for community, or entertainment, or help with their children, or help with their marriages, while they consumed the upbeat music, support groups, dramas, and therapeutic sermons, the hope was that they would find God as well. Here's the problem Carrie Newhoff says. You get them with entertainment, you have to keep them with entertainment. Listen, the goal of Rock Church, this is why I want you to understand why we do some of the things that we do. Why we're not about, listen, I don't just do gimmicky things to fill seats. It's why we preach hard truth. I do not want entertainment keeping you in our church. I don't want entertainment bringing you to our church. I want Jesus Christ to bring you to this church. I want Jesus Christ to keep you in this church. If you leave here from a message and it stings a little bit, praise God he's doing a work in your heart. It's easy to get up here and tell you Jesus loves you. You should feel good about yourself. You're awesome just the way you are. You're beautiful. God sees the good in you. I can say all of that every single week. That does not change hearts. You know what changes hearts? You are so broken and depraved, you need to get to the end of yourself and let Jesus come in and fill you. That's the gospel. You know, recently, you know, I'm in a network of pastors. And... <clears throat> We got into a little scuffle at one of our meetings because it's not all bad what they're trying to do. Listen, a lot of pastors try to bait people into church. It's not from a bad place heart-wise, right? They want people to come in the doors. They'll use things like Super Bowl, um, tailgating parties. Um, they'll do different things, right, to attract people into the church. But listen, like he said, as soon as you do that, as soon as you start entertaining, you build a church full of consumers, a church full of people that just want to come and be entertained. Man, I hope worship's good today. Man, I hope Josiah's sermon's not boring. Right? Man, I hope I receive something. You can think of church that way, or you can think of church this way. I'm going to show up and pour out. What can I give today? What can I sacrifice? Am I praying for the pastor? Am I walking up to people and loving them? Am I worshiping God? Am I contributing somewhere? Am I serving the team? Right? Consumerism is an error on both sides. It's not just the church leadership. It's also butts and seats. Are you consumeristic or are you showing up to serve? Do you come to get or do you come to give? Now, I just made it really quiet in here. Good. Now, the next portion of scripture that I'm going to go into obviously probably caught some of your ears. Did, I, did the women section catch anyone's ears? Yeah, see, they're all the women. They're like, yeah, what are you going to say here, Josiah? The women should keep silent in the church. All my men are like, amen. No, I'm just joking. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the, also the law also says. 
If there is anything they desire to learn, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are the command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Listen, when reading scripture, first rule in building doctrine is we do not build doctrine on a single passage. Biblical theology takes the whole of scripture. I have to read it in context. I have to read a verse within a chapter, a chapter within a book, a book within the New Testament, the New Testament within the whole Bible. And I have to read it in that context. We know this, in the Corinthian church, there was a problem with female domination. Domination. Right? The females were overstepping their bounds. Scholar Kent Hughes says it this way. Paul is talking about the authoritative weighing of prophecies specifically in terms of the women. Apparently, there was a situation in Corinth where when the prophecies were being weighed, certain women were interjecting, asking questions, perhaps even challenging the rulings. In a broader cultural context where women were generally submissive, this would have brought shame upon the husbands of such women. It would be dishonorable. She would be dishonoring her husband by challenging the authority of the church leadership in this way. That's not the only thing that we use in scripture. We understand this going on contextually, but we also know other places in the New Testament there were female prophets. Well, if there's female prophets that Paul commends in the church, they're getting up and prophesying, how's he gonna then also tell them to be quiet in church? That's contradictory. Paul's dealing with a specific cultural contextual problem. You understand that? Now, that's not all I'm gonna say though. Paul here goes back to God being a God of order. And listen, female submission to her husband is biblical at all times. Does that mean she's a slave of her husband? No. Does that mean that he abuses her? No. That means she has a temperament of submission and respect because he is a spiritual head in her life. Do we understand that? So we know, I don't think that we have a problem of women running over all of our men in our church. I don't think this is an issue here but I want you to understand what's going on scripturally, okay? Moving on. So then, my brothers, verse 39, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. See, Paul here seems to extensively talk about prophecy. And here gives us a command that we should earnestly desire to prophesy. New Testament, listen, I'm gonna define a prophecy here for you. This is a hard thing to define. Here's what I want you to know. Old Testament prophecy was oftentimes infallible. I mean, it would be written down, it would be authoritative. We know in New Testament prophecy, when someone prophesies, it's to be weighed. What does that mean? That you could be wrong. That when someone comes up, listen, on Sunday mornings, when someone comes up, says something to Keith, has a word, comes up here, have you, we've all seen this happen, they give a word to the congregation. That is not authoritative like the Bible is. What they're saying could be an error. We have to discern it scripturally and with the Holy Spirit and listen. But he earnestly desires for us to desire it. Now, here's a, here's a definition of what New Testament prophecy is. Prophecy as a gift of the Holy Spirit combines pastoral insight into the needs of persons, communities, and situations with the ability to address these with a God-given utterance or longer discourse, whether unprompted or prepared with judgment, decision, and rational reflection, leading to challenge or comfort, judgment or consolation, but ultimately building up the addressee. So prophecy is a word, an utterance given from God for a specific situation, a specific person, a specific body. Now, that sounds really fancy, but here's really what it is. Have you ever been in a church service? You've been sitting there, you've been praying, and God just puts something on your thoughts that you know is biblical. Maybe you walk in and you recognize all the hurt in the body. Maybe you see the pain from congregants. And God puts something like Psalm 23 in your head. 
even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He puts that, and you come up here, and you say that to the church to comfort them. You just prophesy. We overcomplicate this. Maybe you run into a person, and they're telling you of their struggles and their pains, and you remember a scripture that you read, and you know the truth of the word of God, and you give them a word for that situation. You just prophesy. This is not complicated. We overcomplicate it. But Paul here says that you should earnestly desire to prophesy. Why? Because it's not all about us. It's about giving. When you show up to a service, my dream is that I would have a line down this aisle of people that have spent time with God and want to give words of prophecy to everyone. I don't want to be the main show, uninterested, because guess what? I had a bad week. I don't even feel like preaching. Maybe I need some of y'all to come preach. You hear what I'm saying? I don't want a church built around one man. I want a church full of people that worship God together and show up to pour out, that aren't just consumers, but they're givers. Thanks, Anna. So what's the best way, listen, he says that we should earnestly, what's the best way to improve in prophecy? To get this gift, number one, desire it. Do you desire to pour out and be used by God to give words? Number two, if you do, which you should, by the way, if you don't, unfortunately, it's a command, so it's a sin. Hate to be that guy. If the Bible commands it and you don't do it, guess what? It's a sin. Number two, pursue it. Pursue it. Number three, get alone with God, get in your word, and pray. We know this. Listen, can I tell you that sometimes it's monotonous? Our time with the Lord is monotonous. We get up, we open our Bible app, we do our thing, we pray, we go on with our day. Next morning, we get up, we open our Bible app, we do our devotion, we pray. It feels monotonous. But there's this quote I read this week that was so good. It said this, our daily Bible readings are often forgotten the moment we rise. But in time, they form in us a deep and lasting reservoir of true spirituality. And if there's one thing that I've seen in my own life and in the lives of people around me is that monotonous time with God, man, you will be confronted with situations in your life and that reservoir of spirituality that you spent with God will be there. It will form and shake you. We don't see it day to day, our growth, but we look back so often, three years ago, and you're like, wow, Maybe God is changing me. We've got to be disciplined in that. If you want to prophesy, if you want to have words for people from God, you have to spend time with God. Specifically, you have to spend time knowing his word. And the last one is this, do it. This is the hardest part. You have to have the boldness and the courage to do it. I do not need super high intellectuals with masters in divinities or PhDs in seminary. I don't need that. I need people that have spent time with God and that are willing to do it in faith. Step out and do it in faith. You guys know one of my favorite stories in the Bible is God spoke through an ass so he can speak through any of you. I'm just a little kid and I like cussing in church, I guess. So earnestly desire to prophesy, but in all things, do it in order, because we serve a God of order, and this is the last point I want to hit this week. God is a God of order. We know this in Genesis. Listen, God made everything perfect. God made everything good and with order. Walking in God's ways and in God's order is walking in perfection. Listen, God's order, listen to this, God's order is not a cage, it is freedom. Real freedom is walking in the order of God. It's the destruction of sin that brings slavery. Jordan Peterson, you guys probably know who he is, the famous psychologist says this, that to live a successful human life, you must have one foot in order and one foot in chaos. He says, he uses surfing as an example. What do I mean by that? The Hawaiians obsessed with surfing live this principle perfectly, he said. They train themselves on a surfboard with small waves. But when that big one comes, 
that violent wave, that chaos comes, and they've trained themselves well, and they get up on a giant wave that's chaos, noise, everything, death is right there, and they are perfectly riding a surfboard down a wave. That is the line between order and chaos. Okay, Josiah, what are you talking about? How does that have anything to do? I believe biblically this is absolutely true. I wanna paraphrase and say it this way, that you must be grounded in the order of God So you're ready to confront the chaos of the world. We know we need to spend time with God through healthy rhythms of grace, church, Bible study, community, sacraments. We don't know when God will confront us with a situation to pour out what we've received. In that moment when I met with a ministry opportunity to show Jesus, the mundane of order and study and time with him prepares me to confront it. I can tell you that as a pastor, weekly, I'm confronted with the chaos of sin in your lives and also in my lives. Paul says, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. But all things should be done decently and in order. Would you guys stand up with me? Listen, there's something innately inside each one of us that desires this order. Although it's really difficult to achieve because we are fallen and we are sinful. All of us crave, and one time there's a story I have to say, I'll give you an example. One time I was going to a certification up in Minneapolis and I was going with my brother-in-law, Brandon. We were going to move that certification. And my mom's like, hey, I've got this friend you guys can stay with. She's gonna be great. Okay, she's, a, she's known you since you were this tall. She'll love to take you in. It'll be a free place to stay. Listen, we show up, and I'm like, oh, this will be cool. This saves us money. You know, we're, we show up. Something happened in the last 20 years. She became like a really messy pack rat. I'm not ta- I'm talking about like TV show hoarders pack rat. And we got there, and we're walking through the hallways, and there's boxes everywhere. And I remember she's being super sweet. She's like, oh, yeah, here's your room. She brings us into our room, and we're like sliding by boxes. She walks back downstairs. I look at Brandon and said, hey, we're getting out of here. <laughs> There's no way I'm sleeping in this house. I don't know what's behind this box. I'm gone. So being the non-spiritual person that I was at the time, I snuck out without even saying bye. I just dipped. Guys, will you laugh? That's kind of funny. <laughs> Thanks, a bunch of fake laughs. So anyway, But my point is this, listen, inside of us, there is a desire for order. God is a God of order. Little things matter. I don't know why I'm gonna go here, but listen, if you have a messy house, I want you to know that God's a God of order. I know that's random, but I feel like people need to hear it. All of us have areas in our life that are chaos. And we need to recognize that. God's calling us to be a people of order. If you remember, I opened up the sermon saying this, If you will be a person whose life is ordered, we will show up and have a people willing to pour their lives out for others. Because it's in that mundane order, waking up, spending time with God, praying, doing the disciplined thing that maybe feel monotonous, you may feel nothing from God, but if you keep doing it, he will form and shape you into a person that pours out to others. And that's his desire for this house. Listen, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 19 through 20 says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Do you understand that your own body is a house that needs to be ordered? That Jesus Christ lives inside of you. If there's anything that's out of order, we need to put it right for him. His holiness will have nothing to do with chaos. You guys bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God that holds us and keeps us, that we know that we can be messy humans, that we can be out of order in so many different areas, that we have sin and struggles in our lives, but God, still you sent your son who died for us. Despite our messes, Lord, you reached down. You said, you know what? No, you're mine. God, would we receive that grace? Would we acknowledge areas and repent of areas that we see that are messy in our lives? Father, I pray for strength and boldness for people in this room to pursue prophecy, to pursue pouring out in our services each week. 
God, would you continue to bless this church, continue to do what only you can do? And all God's people said, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord?